Sure. So, um, so right. So this is uh, the first biologic agent that's really been approved for ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis. Um, but, but the first one in ankylosing spondylitis, it really is very specific in its target to what we think is the cause of the disease or the inflammatory pathway that's important. And so I think at least with the, with the tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, which work very well for the disease, we sort of got lucky with those drugs. We, got, we used them and got them approved in rheumatoid arthritis first and then tried them in AS and they worked. And so we've used them for the last, you know, what, 14 years. With this drug, it actually does not work in rheumatoid arthritis, and it specifically works in ankylosing spondylitis. So, so that's sort of why this is very exciting, is that we're working towards targeted therapy in a very different way. Um, the, the studies for this drug look good. In other words, the FDA approved the drug for the indication in ankylosing spondylitis. In the studies that were done, there is uh, the phase three randomized control trials. Uh, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, just in the last few months. And, uh, and what we, we know about the drug in the studies is that uh, about 60% of patients had a good response or a response adequate to get approval by the FDA um, for AS and that actually up to a third of the patients in the trial were inadequate responders or had contraindications to using a TNF inhibitor. So that's great because it means that even if you didn't respond to a TNF inhibitor and you have active AS, this may be a good alternative option for you. Now the ideal candidate, so, so what we know about this drug is that it is fantastic for psoriasis. And in fact, that's where it's had the most robust response, where it, where we've had difficulty clearing psoriasis before in patients, this drug really does mop the floor of psoriasis. Um, the one place where I would add caution is that it, if you have active inflammatory bowel disease, this is not a good drug for you. And in fact, when it was tried in Crohn's disease, but just not without arthritis, without arthritis, but just Crohn's, Crohn's disease, people actually had uh, no response, it may be more disease activity. So if you have active inflammatory bowel disease, and, and probably even if you have inflammatory bowel disease, this is not the drug I would prescribe for you. Right, so, um, and, and that's the first key is that we wouldn't want to screen patients for heart involvement without having symptoms. So the symptoms of heart disease, well, it depends on what the uh, complication is. With regards to ischemic heart disease, that's, that's blockages of the arteries in the heart, typically patients will present with chest pain, especially chest pain with exertion and uh, shortness of breath, when, especially when the heart stops pumping properly. So, so blockages in the heart typically lead to chest pain, but it's, but it's especially chest pain with exertion, which then, then can become chest pain even at rest, um, and that would be a warning sign. Now these symptoms, and, and certainly this complication, does not typically happen early in AS. I would not expect this to happen in someone under the age of 45, and typically even this would be a later complication. So thinking 50 plus. Um, with regards to conduction problems, so conduction is the electricity in the heart. We actually have an electrical circuit in the heart that helps the heart pump. And there has been a description that people could have more conduction problems in the heart. You might have more palpitations or, or heartbeat that is irregular or fast. Um, and you might have shortness of breath as well. Typically, those problems don't lead to chest pain. Um, with regards to inflammation of the aorta, the big, big vessel, often patients have no symptoms and it may be found uh, for other reasons. Like on physical exam, there may be something or you have a study for another reason and then they notice that your aorta is inflamed. Um, but at this point, and based on the research that we're doing right now at UCSF, we have not found enough evidence to say everyone should be screened for this.
Oh, that's a <clears throat> that's a very good question, and and of course a difficult question. So so I think you know any time we think about treating a patient, we think about the risk and the benefit, and it partly depends on how active the AS is or the spondylitis is, and how bad a complication the histoplasmosis was. So and and you know I'm in California, so we don't see a lot of histoplasmosis here. We see coccidiomycoses, which is a different fungal infection. But I assume that probably the protocol is similar, where if you really have indication for spondylitis treatment with a biologic, then uh, we would probably recommend co-treating it with preventative uh, antifungals through the course of treating with the TNF inhibitor or now the Cosentex or Secacanumab. Uh, that's very patient dependent. So I don't, I don't think that the, as I said, I don't think that there's one recipe for everyone. Uh, and relieving pain and slowing down progression are not necessarily the same things. So I'll address, try to address them separately. So from a relieving pain relief standpoint, it partly depends on what's causing the pain. If the pain is being caused by inflammation, then the treatment would be first line is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs things like um, naproxen, but there are a lot of prescription strength ones that work very well. If that doesn't work, or if there's a contraindication to them, then the next step is a biologic, and that would be, and that would be with um, uh, one of the TNF inhibitors, or uh, now secacinumab or Cosentex. So that's, that would address the pain if the pain is coming from inflammation. If the uh, pain is coming from other causes, like for example damage, then uh, we would not recommend adding more immunosuppression to treat the pain from damage, unless that damage is associated with ongoing inflammation. Um, with regards to stopping progression, there are um, this is actually this is my area of research interest. I, I can tell you that there are some things from a lifestyle standpoint that are definitely associated with more progression. Smoking is one of them, um, and so definitely smoking tobacco is very bad for the disease, both in promoting inflammation and uh, con causing continued damage. Um, the actual inflammation itself is a risk factor for progression, so treating the inflammation with the drugs that we just talked about. And then finally, what we know is that if you have a lot of inflammation, we would like to treat you earlier. Earlier treatment is definitely associated with less progression down the road. So if you've had the disease for 20 years and you already have a lot of damage, it's harder to treat the disease to prevent progression, even though we can treat the disease to, to treat pain. Um, they're not common complications, but I think anyone with arthritis in the back can develop these. So I would say they're actually more commonly related to degenerative disease than spondylitis. Um, and in fact, spondylitis patients, when they fuse, often don't develop degenerative disc disease because they fuse between the vertebral bodies or over the disc. So, uh, so not common, but can occur, and uh, the surgical in uh, indications depend on whether there's any neurologic involvement and, and of course, pain. Yeah, I mean, it's such a rare complication that I didn't even add it to, uh, to the talk today because, I mean, in the probably 1,000 patients I've seen, I've had one case of it, um, but, but the this is a, a problem in, uh, in the low back where from inflammation you actually get uh, neurologic uh, problems. Typically patients will present with bowel or bladder incontinence and uh, pain and weakness in the legs and the tr there is actually not a lot of treatment for it, but it doesn't happen until very late in the disease when people are fully ankylosed. So, it should not be suspected in people that do not have complete ankylosis of the low back. Ah, the million dollar question. If I had the answer to that, I'd be rich. Um, so, so with regards to why it affects different joints, 
You know, so, I mean, I think in ankylosing spondylitis, if you look at where the common joints are, the sacroiliac joints, oops, the, the sacroiliac joints and the, um, the spine, those are uh, weight-bearing joints or joints that you put a lot of load on, and that's probably partly why those joints are affected um, compared to, say, the small joints in your fingers. We believe that uh, one of the, the primary reasons people get inflammation is that uh, there are tendon, tendons and ligaments that insert on the bones, in the spine, around the sacroiliac joints, in the, around the knees, around the ankles, and it's where those uh, antheses or tendons and ligaments insert on the bone, where they become inflamed, that, that's where we think the arthritis starts from. Um, but that's still really being figured out. So I would say, in general, where the load happens is where the arthritis uh, tends to occur. There's uh, some nice animal model data that shows when you take a mouse and you suspend them by their tail, they don't develop arthritis in their hind legs, you're offloading their hind legs, suggesting that loading on the joints is part of the reason people get the arthritis. Uh, very, yeah, very good question. So, so we do see more high blood pressure in patients with AS, and uh, the reason for that is not entirely clear. Pain can definitely uh, contribute towards high blood pressure, but the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, etc., also can. So, so whether it's directly related to the medications that are used or because of the pain that is not controlled is not entirely clear. Um, and then, of course, um, men tend to have more severe AS and, and more damage, and whether that contributes to also more high blood pressure. We don't see it as much in women as we do in men. Um, but So it's, it's partly probably the disease itself may be contributing towards uh, pain and increased blood pressure, but also the medications that we use can do the same thing. No, I haven't actually. I don't see that as a complication from AS. I mean, anything can do anything. <laughs> I, I never, <laughs> I never rule out, I, I never rule out anything. But uh, unless the cervical spine is pressing on the the trachea, um, I don't like. I don't think about that as a common manifestation. No, and there's no nodules that can happen. Like in other diseases, you can see problems with the larynx because of nodules related to the disease. I don't see that in spondylitis. Uh, the only other thing I'd say is that reflux can definitely cause laryngeal problems, and some of the meds that we would use for AS may cause reflux, um, but not directly. Yeah, um, also uh, a good question uh, in terms of, you know, when we, when we sort of get approval for drugs to treat diseases, we don't do it with, well, how, these are chronic diseases, so we don't think about, like, an infection where if you have strep throat, we treat you for 10 days and then you don't have to take anything. These are not reversible diseases, we don't think. They are chronic diseases. Now, that said, when we get approval, we get approval for a certain amount of disease activity that warrants a biologic. What we know less about is how long people need to be on the drugs and, and whether you can decrease the dose or not. That's being studied now. So what I would say is that what we know is if you have ankylosing spondylitis where if you did an x-ray and there is damage on the x-ray, then if you go on the drug and you, you do great and you stop the drug, most people will develop recurrence of their disease within a period of weeks to months. If you catch the disease very, very early, before you develop damage, and then you go on a biologic, it is possible that you may induce a, a deeper remission that you could come off the drug for longer or completely. But we just don't know yet whether that's possible. We're studying it actually in trials right now. Uh, the other question is whether we can dose reduce the biologic. So that has been studied. Uh, if you think about countries with more limited resources, actually this was done in Croatia, 
where they have a, a limited amount of biologics per a certain number of patients that need them. And so they, they randomize people to decreasing the dose versus staying on the regular dose. And sure enough, they didn't see an, a difference in flares uh, on the reduced dose. So it's possible that people that are doing really well and then reduce the dose will still do really well long term. But those are still, those questions are still being studied. Uh, yeah, fibro so fibromyalgia is a, um, a it is a, a comorbidity, it's a chronic pain syndrome or widespread pain that happens either alone or in association with another rheumatic disease. Uh, often patients that have had long-standing pain uh, will then develop fibromyalgia and we think that this is actually a neurologic problem, not a, like if you take someone with fibromyalgia who has pain in their elbow, for example, and then you do a biopsy of that area where they have pain and where you press, there's actually no problem at the joint. The problem is the brain sending a signal to the joint saying you have pain there. So it is not, it's, an un, it's a common comorbidity in terms of any rheumatic disease. Um, and obviously we're treating the underlying problem like the ankylosing spondylitis. If that's what's causing the pain, then, then the fibromyalgia is not really fibromyalgia. But sometimes fibromyalgia needs to be treated uh, independent of the primary rheumatic disease. And uh, the treatments that we, that we generally recommend for this are going to be uh, aerobic exercise is very, very important, good sleep hygiene, and then uh, sometimes cognitive behavioral therapy. And there are also pharmacologic medicines that can help some of the pain. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, you know, because it affects the kidneys, we'll typically look at the urine to see uh, if there is any protein in the urine. That's a very sensitive way to, to see if amyloidosis may be affecting you. But, but usually what happens is we screen patients for kidney function, and if there's a abnormal kidney function, then we go looking for why. So, um, so non-radiographic axial spinal arthritis is a long term, um, and uh, and it was it was developed because of the fact that what we so I'm going to go back to 2005, 2005, and before that, the way we would diagnose people with ankylosing spondylitis is by doing an X-ray, by by getting a history, and then by suspecting the disease, and then you did an X-ray, and if the X-ray had damage, you called the patient ankylosing spondylitis. Now, we realized at that time that many patients hadn't developed damage yet, but they still have the disease. So that's not fair to say someone doesn't have the disease because they don't have damage. And we started using MRIs to find the inflammation before patients developed damage. So non-radiographic really refers to x-ray. It's not no imaging. It means that you have the disease, but you, it hasn't shown up on x-ray yet. And so non-radiographic axial spinal arthritis is, in a sense, just on the left side of the spectrum of AS, but it's all one spectrum. And we believe that these diseases should be tra treated the same way. Um, so in other words, the indication for treatment would be based on signs and symptoms. Um, some patients with non-radiographic axial spinal arthritis will never go on to develop AS. And some patients really are just an early form of AS and, and will go on to develop it, though maybe our medications could prevent that. Not really, actually. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, it, I haven't studied it, though, um, but I haven't seen a change in disease activity in the perimenopause state in women. Yeah, so so in my personal experience with pregnancy, actually my female patients have done relatively well. I would say two-thirds of patients have completely come off their medications around pregnancy or in pregnancy and then stayed off of them until after they deliver. And a third of patients have required staying on their biologic um, through pregnancy NSAIDs can't be used in the third trimester, so they have to be stopped anyway. Um, but I, patients have, women have tended to, to do okay in terms of 
whether it's because they're just sacrificing their uh, need to be on medicines for the baby. But, you know, these days actually at least one of the biologics doesn't cross the placenta enough that we would even stop it. So sedolizumab or simsia doesn't cross. So very, very safe in pregnancy. Um, but, but a lot of patients in my mind have done well through pregnancy where we tend to see people uh, do less well or, or have a return of disease activities in that postpartum state where you're not sleeping well. So as a, as a woman, you have a newborn at home and you're getting up multiple times a night to nurse um, and then your AS becomes more active. And then, of course, you're not exercising as much because you're busy with a newborn. So, so that postpartum state can be associated with more disease activity, but not because of hormones, rather because of uh, changes to lifestyle and demands and stress. Yeah. Um, so the first thing is to, to really make sure that the pain, the back pain is coming from a AS flare as opposed to another reason for back pain because back pain is common and so just because you have AS doesn't mean that every time you have back pain it's going to be rega with regards to an AS flare. Um, if it is truly an AS flare then it depends on what you're on. So for patients that are not taking anything on a regular basis and then they have a flare the recommendation would be to start with a full strength non-steroidal. So uh, something over the counter that's easy to access is naproxen, uh, brand name Aleve. And if you take two Aleve twice a day, that approximates a full dose of an NSAID. And you can do that. It takes about 48 hours to see full effect. But that would be first line if you're not on anything and you have an AS flare. In addition to that gentle stretching, some patients find heat helpful and some patients find uh, cold helpful. Uh, I know patients that really like the icy hot patches you can get over the counter. Getting in a hot tub or a hot bath or a hot shower often tends to help. Um, and, uh, and then, like I said, gentle stretching. With regards to being on an NSAID and then flaring, so assuming that you're taking a full dose of an NSAID, so if you're just taking it, say, as needed, then again you go up to a full dose. Um, if you're on a full dose of an NSAID and then you flare, that's a tougher decision because we don't do biologics for just single flares. We do biologics for more chronic disease activity. Um, but certainly if you're having frequent flares, that would be defined as chronic disease activity and it would be reasonable to think about trying a biologic to control the number of flares that you're having. If you're on a biologic and then you flare, then adding a non-steroidal to that would be a good idea. And again, all of this is uh, making sure that you're doing your exercises, you're sleeping well, you've minimized the stress in your life, and, and uh, uh, all the other things that are, are going to help control your disease activity. So I think it just depends on the individual patient and what they're taking and what else they're doing in their life that might be contributing to their flare. Yeah, so the heel. The heel is a good place for inflammation in AS or related diseases. Uh, and I didn't address it in this talk because, in a sense, it's not a comorbidity. It's actually a joint problem. Not, it, it's a, it's a uh, musculoskeletal problem. So, so the heel inflammation in AS, if it's the back of the heel, that's probably Achilles tendonitis. And if it's underneath the heel, like on the uh, bottom of the foot, that's probably plantar fasciitis. And that is directly related to inflammation of the bone, the calcaneus bone and where the tendon of the Achilles tendon inserts on the bone and where the plantar fascia tissue inserts on the bottom of the calcaneus. So what to do about it? So um, there are stretches and, and uh, foot exercises that are helpful. If it's Achilles tendonitis, then using a heel lift and lifting the heel and shortening the Achilles tendon is helpful. If it's plantar fasciitis, then uh, there are some exercises that you can do for that, uh, like toe curls on a towel, for example, or around a, um, a step. So, and if you just look these up, plantar fasciitis or Achilles tendonitis, you'd get a sense of which one it is and what you can do. And then non-steroidals are first line, so they will, t if it's inflammation, then things like, again, ibuprofen or naproxen will help. Um, the inflammation, and sometimes we even need to use biologics for this.
So cardiomyopathy, cardio is heart. Myopathy is the muscle. There's a problem with the muscle of the heart. So, card so cardiomyopathy is a very broad term that can include people that have um, ischemic heart disease. So if you have a blockage in the vessels of the heart, then that can lead to a weakened heart muscle. Um, and that's probably the most common cause for cardiomyopathy. And we sort of addressed why people get blockages in the vessels and, and the relationship of that to longstanding ankylosing spondylitis and inflammation. Uh, there are also, of course, inherited forms of cardiomyopathy, which are not related to AS at all. Um, and there are even medicines and drugs and toxins that can cause cardiomyopathy. So it's quite a broad term. And I would say, at least with rela relation to ankylosing spondylitis, the most common cause of cardiomyopathy will be blockages of the arteries, car coronary artery disease leading to ischemic heart disease. And, and how to prevent that is really to maintain a healthy heart with usual things that you would do, like not smoking and uh, exercising and maintaining your weight, eating healthy, keeping your cholesterol down, uh, in addition to if you have high inflammation from the AS treating that. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So, so the studies suggest that there is a slightly lower life expectancy in AS compared to the control, control groups, but that's actually more in men than in women. Women, there does not seem to be a difference, and it's probably because men with AS tend to have more inflammation and more damage. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at, uh, so that, and I, that study was uh, recently published looking at the Ontario data in, in uh, Canada. Um, so, so I would say that there, there probably is in some patients, and so not all patients with AS or with spondylitis are going to have lower life expectancy, but those with a higher amount of inflammation and those with more ankylosis of the spine are the ones that, that are going to see this as a uh, potential long-term complication. Less likely women, less likely those younger patients, less likely those with lower burden of inflammation. <clears throat> 